What up, Z-Pack? It's your boy, Z-Dog MD. Check it out. It's Suit Sunday against Medical Advice. Tom and Logan are with us today. Booyah! Ooh, ooh. Yeah, and we have a couple of doctors in the studio audience. Do we have a camera for them? No, because we're broke. And speaking of broke, what we're talking about today is how do we reform healthcare? How do we fix healthcare in this country? Is it broken? How do we fix it? The Imperial Senate is debating this very topic right now with the, what is it? The Emperor. Better, <laughs> the Better Care Reconciliation Act, which is an upgrade of the American Health Care Act, which is a supposed to be repeal and replace of the Affordable Care Act. It's the typical acronym soup that we have in healthcare. Let's talk about this. And we, may, we put in a real provocative title because we want you guys to understand what is the, the discussion even about? Is it about is healthcare a right? Is healthcare a privilege? No, that's a dumb question. It's a dumb way to look, up, look at this at all. A better question is what is the right thing to do for the most people in this country? Okay. First of all, what's the problem with healthcare in the U.S.? It's about $3,500 per person per year in the developed world that has universal health coverage or some facsimile thereof where everybody's covered usually through a government plan. In the US, it costs about $8,700 per person per year, and that's only going up. Now, that would be great. That's fine if we got $8,700 worth of better care. But it turns out we lag the other developed countries in terms of actual outcomes. In fact, one of the most humiliating ones are maternal fetal outcomes, childbirth, people dying in childbirth, uh, infant mortality. And you can give a million reasons for why that is. We're a diverse, heterogeneous country with big economic swings in, in disparity. But the bottom line is it exists. So the question now is with the government debating, OK, do we repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, which was already a flawed act, with something else that I'm going to tell you right now is also it, basically what we're doing is we're reshuffling deck chairs on the sinking Titan Titanic. And we've been doing this now for decades. And the question is, is there a better way, right, to do this? Tom, what do you think? Gentlemen, it was a pleasure playing with you on this majestic vessel. <laughs> Near, far, where, <coughs> That's what healthcare reform's like. It's like trying to hit that high note on the deck of the Titanic, and you're like, I'm king of the world, but I'm broke. And we have limited resources, and we do a lot of things to patients, but not necessarily a lot of things for patients. And that's what makes it really hard. So here's the thing. 20, okay, when the Affordable Care Act came out, they said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Obama wanted to pass a big signature piece of legislation, and he wanted to do it quickly while they, the Democrats still had control of the Senate and Congress. So they pushed something through without a single Republican vote that had a lot of lobbying from the insurance industry, medical devices, pharma, everybody else. So this bill said, look, this isn't really care reform. We're not changing health care. We're changing how it's paid for. It's insurance reform. Basically, to summarize, the Affordable Care Act said everybody's got to get insurance. There's a mandate or you get a fine on your taxes. Or if you're a company and you're over a certain size, 50 employees, whatever it was, you will get a penalty if you don't provide health care for your employees. Now, to make this health care more affordable, putting the affordable in the Affordable Care Act, we're going to create these exchanges where companies compete to try to get patients and businesses. And initially, the idea was there'd be a public option. In other words, a government-sponsored health care plan that would force everybody to lower their rates to compete. That was beaten down by, mostly by the insurance industry that felt it was unfair. So what you end up having is a, a monstrous bill that nobody read that went into action. And now what happens is everybody's mandated to buy insurance. Now, did everybody buy insurance? No, because the individual mandate was fairly weak. So a lot of people said, no, nah, I don't want to. And what ended up happening was a lot of the exchanges started falling apart because insurance companies realized they were now forced to cover people with pre-existing conditions, which, by the way, is 25 to 50% of the US population. Did you know that? No. 
25 to 50 percent of Americans have a pre-existing condition. My wife in the pre-Obamacare era, we, we were self-employed for a while. We had to get insurance. We were looking for insurance. We applied. They said, no, declined. Do you know why? Because Mrs. Dog has something called an osteochondroma. It's a benign growth on her ankle that was seen on an x-ray that was a, she had some, she had twisted her ankle and they found it as an incidentaloma. Very rarely these can be malignant, but hers had all the, the sort of hallmarks of a benign bone tumor. Well, the insurance company saw this in her medical record, which they have access to, and said, oh, hell no, we're not covering someone who's going to get cancer. That's how insurance worked pre-ACA. Now, ACA said, no, you cannot decline people based on pre-existing conditions. And there are 10 essential benefits that you have to cover if you're going to be on these exchanges. And you cannot cap lifetime payouts. It used to be they would cap it at like $3 million or a $1 million. So if you end up getting a heart transplant or something, you actually are in danger of reaching a lifetime cap and going medically bankrupt, which, by the way, medical bills in the US are the number one cause of bankruptcy in the United States. The rest of the world less so because they have universal coverage that's sponsored by the government. So this being said, this is what ACA changed. They said, okay, now you guys are forced to do these things. Now, the problem with that is actuarially from a risk pool standpoint, it doesn't really work with insurance companies to have to cover these expensive pre-existing conditions. The sickest people then went on to the exchanges because there were no more prohibitions on pre-existing coverage and costs ended up ratcheting up because the healthy people were still not necessarily coming into the pool and paying premiums and getting insurance because the individual mandate wasn't strong enough. So you weren't really forced to get insurance. And so as a result, things started to weaken and there clearly needed to be changes to this bill to make it in any way effective. Well, now the Republicans come into office and they say, okay, we actually campaigned on this idea of let's Let's throw out ACA, repeal and replace it with something better, or at least repeal it. Well, of course, once you start down a path where people are getting coverage, it is political suicide to remove coverage from people. So if you say now, well, okay, the Affordable Care Act covered these people that are between 100 and 400% of the poverty line, it expanded Medicaid, which is coverage for the poorest Americans, and many states that took the expanded Medicaid, Nevada included, are extremely reluctant now to roll that back because you're gonna have a lot of angry voters saying, you took my coverage away that now you gave me. So now we're in a situation where the Republicans wanna do this new plan, but they're gonna get hella pushback and they already are. The question is, is their plan any more transformative than the Affordable Care Act? Here's my answer. Neither one was particularly transformative. Both of them are fundamentally flawed because they don't address the actual care that's being given. They don't address escalating costs in any meaningful way. For, for in other words, the idea that in the United States we're really incentivized to do a lot of things to people in healthcare, but not necessarily prevent disease or focus on outcomes or focus on population health or focus on mental health or focus on social de uh, determinants of health. And as a result, we have the most expensive healthcare in the world. Why? Because the US healthcare system, unlike many other countries, has to absorb the cost of our social failure poverty, economic disparity, all the other things that go with that. And if you look at Medicaid, which we expanded under ACA, is that an ideal way to take care of our poorest Americans? It gives them a carte blanche in some ways. It says all the stuff is covered. There's no copay, say, for an emergency visit. Uh, ambulance is cheap. Medications are covered. Certain medications are covered. Well, what's that going to do? It's going to up utilization but not necessarily improve outcomes? Does it focus on prevention? Does it focus on communities? Does it focus on uh, getting people back into the workforce? No, not necessarily. So here's a problem, and the Republicans, I think, are right. Now remember, I'm a guy who skews a little bit left, but I like to see both sides, and the older I get, the more I see both sides as true but partial. So yes, actually, you do need some accountability in Medicaid. It's not perfect. So I could see why Republicans say expanding it hasn't been a great idea, but good luck trying to contract it now, right? And then you have Medicare for 65 and older, and what does Medicare do, Tom? It pays fee for service for the most part, there's some exceptions, 
For medical care for our eldest patients who have the most chronic disease, who suffer the worst at end of life and cost the most money, and again, no focus on prevention, no focus on community, no focus on building um, teams, those kind of things. And so as a result, costs continue to arise and all the private insurances are pegged to Medicare's reimbursement rates. By the way, Logan, I know you're a fan of America. America. I know you're fairly conservative. Trump. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know you actually care deeply about this country and you want people to get better. Mm. Now, you don't like socialism. I don't. And guess what our healthcare system is now? Communist. It's communist. It's not even socialist. Do you know why? Because what is the hallmark of a communist economic model? Price fixing by the government. Mm. Who sets prices in healthcare right now? The government. The USNA government, the CMS panel on Medicare reimbursement, with the input of lobbyists. Who are the lobbyists? Specialty physicians, other physicians, medical device companies, everybody else that wants their reimbursements to be tied to what they think they're worth. Well, what ends up happening? We have a CMS Medicare reimbursement system that reimburses procedural stuff. It's much more lucrative to take out a cataract or replace a hip than it is to prevent a hip replacement by for getting people to lose weight or prevent a case of diabetes and, and save their eye and their eyesight. That's how backwards we are. So what happens? We have more specialists in the US than we have primary care docs. That is not the case elsewhere in the world. But this, see, but see. How do you prove you prevented it? That's the problem, right? How do you prove it? Ah, you're getting, you're getting into the whole turntable issue. If we prevent a case of diabetes, it doesn't manifest for five years. How do you show value to an insurance company that, that on average keeps an employee, a, a patient, for two years? If I prevent a case of diabetes five years down the line, I've done that company a disservice because I've helped their competitor potentially. This is the fundamental problem in the US. Huge interest, insurance companies, pharma, biomedical research, uh, device manufacturers, and the medical lobby, we all have interests in this, and they are intractable. So if you say, look, I wanna have universal coverage, I wanna do the right thing for all the citizens, give them some minimal level of coverage, you're gonna get a crap storm of stuff. So let's just say that's not a realistic thing as sold like that. It's never gonna happen because of all the, the interests that are involved. Now, now here's the thing. There's this tension, right, when you talk about this stuff, between the idealism of who we wanna be as a people. And I think Logan, as a conservative, will say, we want an accountable people who are free to do what they like to do in a capitalist environment. And the more progressive element will say, well, we want a fair society where there's social justice and everybody has a shot at succeeding. That's in an idealized version of each political angle. You mean everyone gets a trophy, Z? I want a trophy, okay? I want a participation trophy. I want a trophy for winning. I want a trophy for losing. Do you think we should give able-bodied people Medicaid? Well, so here's the question, and this gets back to that. It's less a question of that. It's a question of who are we as a society? There's the ideal of, Everybody should have access to some version of healthcare. Now, here's the thing. They do now. You can walk into an emergency department and get care. So when you see ads that the Democrats are running now against the new Republican plan, they'll show like a kid having an asthma attack and the mother um, freaking out and this kind of thing. And they say, at this point, she doesn't need to worry about whether she has insurance, et cetera. That's the, the voiceover. Don't you dare call me when I'm broadcasting. See, turn off your phone. No. Come on, man. I want people to know how popular I am. That was a, a <laughs> robo-marketer. Probably someone trying to sell me on this uh, got debt, insurance plan. I got debt. I got mad debt, Logan. Um, now I don't even remember what we were talking about. What were we talking about before I got there? Uh, Angela wants to know, <laughs> Z, can you actually define social justice? Because some people don't understand at all what it is. To me, it's when you get on Tumblr and then you whine because your parents didn't give you enough money that month. Is that what it is? I'm not, I'm not going to define social justice. I'm going to define what I think a just society should do and that is provide a minimal level of access to healthcare for everybody, whether you're able-bodied, whether you're not. Now, do I think Medicaid is the right answer for that? Do I think we should give um, very rich benefits to people who are um, uh, in a socioeconomic strata that's challenged? Well, it really depends because you also have to foster some degree of accountability. You have to foster the idea that Personal responsibility does matter, and this 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 is true in on healthcare providers, 
point, and it's true for patients. If you don't hold some degree of accountability for both patients and providers, nothing is going to happen. That's human nature, right? So you can talk about social justice, but the pragmatic truth of it is we have to come up with a situation that does the right thing for as many people as possible. Now, the right thing means, and this is, I'm going to take a stand here, all right? And some people will politically disagree with me. That's okay. I think the right thing in, in our advanced society is that everybody has access to a certain minimum standard of health care. And what that standard is, is what's evidence-based shown that people definitely need to, to, to do well as human beings. And that may be that certain statins are necessary for people. It may be that there's certain emergency surgeries. In a way, it's kind of like what we use catastrophic insurance for now, all right? In order to have a functioning society, we need that. So I'm not going to get into issues of social justice and all of this and whether people who don't work should have all these entitlements. I don't think this is what that is. I'm saying in a functional uh, society where we don't have people riding in the street, where there's a, degree of, uh, there's a degree of affluence that we have as a society that we can then allow a certain standard of rightness, right? Now, that does not mean, that does not mean socialized medicine which by the way is like a VA type system. Socialized medicine is where the government owns all the means of medical production. The hospitals, the doctors, the, you know, the, the, the uh, payment model, that's what the VA is. And you will hear terrible things about the VA and you will hear wonderful things depending. I will say this, I'm gonna take a stand on this. I think socialized medicine in the United States is a horrible idea. It will crush innovation. It will lead to, to people not wanting to go into medicine because they don't want to be government employees. And the government does screw up a lot of what it tries to run. That is simply a fact. Now, where I will take a stand is I will also say, and again, I'm going to say again, Obamacare, AHCA, they're both just, they're both really just rearranging deck chairs. The, the AHCA or the BCRA, whatever they're calling it now, when you pull back Medicaid, you're going to affect the opioid crisis because there's funding for treatment programs. You're going to do a lot of things. But I don't think that's the main problem. I think the main problem is these are not real reform. All right? So this is what I'm going to propose. And you guys can agree or disagree. And we can have this discussion. When we did turntable health, we talked about this idea. And we still talk about this idea of health 3.0. And let me just recap what that is. And I'm going to say how this is going to be the engine of healthcare reform that's actually going to stick. In Health 3.0, we focus on the, the unique patient at hand. We focus on ideas about prevention, so actually stopping that thing that's going to happen five years down the line, which you're not paid to stop, by the way, in our current system. So preventing a diabetes, preventing depression, preventing suicide, preventing coronary heart disease, preventing hypertension, uh, reversing or preventing obesity looking at an entire population and going, how do we address the population, looking at the social determinants of health, the entire 100 acre woods, working in individual units so you can have a direct primary care practice where it's a doc out in the, in the field somewhere getting uh, directly paid by patients or by an entity to take care of patients. That's one model. Uh, an equivalent model that can coexist with that is a team-based approach where it's a doctor, a nurse, a nurse practitioner, a PA, health coaches all working together in service of the patient, but also supporting each other using the latest technology, population health, et cetera. The whole idea is you actually improve outcomes. So that infant mortality, the, you know, the um, uh, 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 death during childbirth, actual outcomes in terms of vaccinations, in terms of preventing diabetes, controlling hypertension, these diseases, chronic diseases that are so much lifestyle, stress, environment driven, actually making a dent in that and having the practitioners practice at the very top of their training and license in teams where they support each other, getting paid on actual outcomes. So paid to prevent the diabetes, prevent the hypertension, all that. So to do the right thing for patients instead of fee-for-service or simple capitation. Now, when you have that as the engine and patients have access to that, this is how you set that up. And then you have specialists by the way. So we have two anesthesiologists. We have an interventional pain doctor and an anesthesiologist in our studio audience today right now. They don't want to be on camera, but they do really amazing stuff in their specialty space. How are they part of this? They get to practice at the top of their license conjuncting with preventative-minded primary care docs that are focused on prevention that are paid on outcomes. Now when you have that, this is how you pay for it. The government or employers 
or individuals, depending on your income and your ability to work and things like that, they pay the primary care teams, the base of this Health 3.0 pyramid, to keep people healthy. So whether it's $40 a month, $50 a month, $100 a month, to have unlimited access to amazing primary care that's judged on actual outcomes. That's the base of the pyramid. Around that, you wrap a catastrophic insurance plan that is what insurance is supposed to do, which is be insurance. Right now, we use insurance to, ch to it would be as if our car, we would use our insurance to change our oil. It makes no sense. Insurance shouldn't cover an oil change, right? That's a separate thing. Insurance covers when you wreck your car. That's how it ought to be in healthcare. Prevent everything that's preventable with primary care that you have open access to, that's relationship driven, that's human, that's health 3.0. Then pay for catastrophic, high deductible wraparound care that covers when you get in the hospital, when you need um, concerted specialty care, when you need expensive uh, or difficult medications. And the whole idea is you try to prevent that need with the primary care core, and if you, if you can't do it, you have the catastrophic insurance that keeps you from going medically bankrupt. Now, for people who can't afford it, the government can subsidize that coverage. It could still be administered by the private sector, but it has to be different. It has to be in a competitive way where the private sector is actually competing to provide the best outcomes for that dollar. And patients can vote with their feet, or employers can vote with their feet, or the government can vote with its feet to say, I'm only going to support those health plans that do the most with this money, that provide the catastrophic coverage. Patient's skin is in the game because they have to pay a deductible unless they can't, in which case, because we have to do the right thing, and I'm going to go on record and say, you re <laughs> <laughs> Logan's got the hashtag communist lies on there. You've got to support people who are down, who cannot uh, uh, get up by themselves, but you also have to hold them accountable and there are ways to do that. Once you do that, there's competition on the private side, there's a government uh, subsidizing stuff that actually works, a care model that's different. You have caregivers who are inspired to be either part of a team, right, or independent practitioners like direct primary care practitioners, um, um, the doctors and, 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 and others who are out in the field doing this autonomously in small rural areas and big urban areas. They want to practice the way they want to practice. Give them the capacity to do that. If they can show that they have great outcomes, pay them to do it. Like that's perfect. That is America, my friends. And then for the, and, and here's, the, here, okay, here's the secret, all right? And I'm starting to rant because I get excited about this stuff. Here's the secret. <laughs> Measure everything. Measure the actual outcomes, right? And the people that are doing well, you reward them with future contracts, with more business, patients go to them, right? The ones that have the best outcomes. And that way you have innovation, you have uh, some degree of, of, of fairness where people are actually getting care because they get care now. It's just terribly expensive and it's horrible and it's wrecking our economy and it's an 18% GDP freaking ball and chain around our ankle that's destroying everything in our future and indenturing our millennial generation. We can't do it. It's time to change. So you can have some form of universal coverage. Everybody gets catastrophic coverage. Everybody gets access to great primary care. We change the culture of how we train doctors so that primary care is sexy again. The specialists get to practice at the very top of their license doing what they do, which is that intuitive high-level medicine that they were trained to do. And we're, and we're incentivized to do the right thing for patients. By doing good, we do well financially. And on top of this, because the government is involved in this, and guess what? They're already 50% of healthcare. So anyone who says it's a communist system, it already is, guys. It's, you can't get them out of it. They need to negotiate drug prices. They need, they need, right? How, how do you motivate the patient? Yeah. So getting patients to be accountable. Right? What we used to do at Turntable is we had health coaches who were from that community who got them to feel intuitively connected to their team and they would motivate them by saying, you know what, I want you to care about me, I want you to care about yourself, and that way you'll feel like you don't want to let either one of us down. And you know what, they're not everybody that's going to work for, but for a lot of people. Now, the other thing is you do need some carrots and sticks. The, the way we do Medicaid now, it's not ideal. I mean, conservatives will tell you this, liberals will tell you this, right? So you, you have to fix that. But the thing is, the government has to be able to negotiate drug prices with, with pharma. And their, pharma's gonna hate that, but it's gotta be done because until you use the leverage of a big uh, payer, like they do in Europe, et cetera, you're not gonna be able to control drug prices. Now, 
What you gotta do is you gotta do it for the essential medications. There's probably 400 or so essential medications that should be covered for everybody as something that's just, there. they just are needed. Everything else, whether you need the latest statin, if you want that, pay out of pocket to a private insurance plan, get it covered or pay out of pocket because this is America. If you want a tiered system, you will get a tiered system like elsewhere in the world where you can pay more and get more. Here's the thing, is it actually better care? That's where you need actual studies to show, well, you know what, the latest statin doesn't do any better than the cheapest statin. Let me ask you a question here, Z. So what about the people that are straight up abusing the system? And I, and I hear the argument, I know the argument you're gonna say back at me is like, it's a certain small percentage of the population that's doing that and so what, we can absorb that within the system. But I don't think that's a static number. To me, it seems like a variable that goes up when you put these incentives in place. So there is data that shows that when you expand Medicaid, there is increased utilization, duh. Mm -hmm. You give somebody something for free, you say you can go to the ER and use it as your primary care, that's what people are gonna do. So the way you disincentivize that is you actually have to have built into the plan. First of all, remember I said, everybody should get a minimal level, level of coverage and sort of mandatory access to primary care. Now you can purchase out of this. So you can say, you know what, I don't wanna see the primary care doc, I wanna spend a ton of money and unnecessarily see a specialist for everything. That's your prerogative. But do you give Joe Blow on the street, right, the, 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 the opportunity to do that when there's no evidence that it helps, that it's expensive, and it encourages overutilization? No. You can't do that. But how do you prevent this from becoming like Europe, where if you wanna see your primary care doc, it's like a year-long wait? Yeah, you know why? Because Europe didn't get this right. I, I'm gonna tell you right now, the United States, and there's no butt hurt to Europe, please, we have an opportunity to actually get this right because if you actually create enough capacity to manage the bare minimum of care, and honestly, it's not that much, right? Then you can have private entities absorbing the people who want all this extra stuff, but there really shouldn't be big, long lines to get basic, basic care. There really shouldn't, right? Back to back world, backward champs. What world, is that? World War champs, Z. <laughs> Are you saying the U.S. is World War champs? Because I two times, Z. Two times. Defending champs, right here. Suck it, France. We came, we kicked some ass, and we got hella awesome culturalization out of it and now I like red wine because of y'all France. Thank you France for being dope um, hey, and, and for freedom fries. Another thing too Z, this model that you're proposing relies an awful lot on statistics at least to my, my ear, that's the way I'm hearing it. And it's really easy to lie with statistics. So how do you get around, how do you avoid that? You wanna, you wanna hear my secret answer? Yeah. AI, <laughs> seriously. Like you think I'm kidding. I want artificial intelligence to do the calculations, to do the thinking on what does it mean to have a good outcome for a patient with diabetes who's 62 and Hispanic whose hopes, dreams, and fears are to see their kids walk. What does it mean on a larger level uh, at, you know, from an AI standpoint, uh, outcomes that actually matter and how do you pay people when they generate those outcomes? What's the asymptote we're striving towards? It's gonna take a lot of technology. I don't think technology will ever replace the human relationship at the heart of healthcare. That's why I called it turntable because it's an analog relationship. But you need it to help you do stuff that right now we're really, 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 really bad at. So look, take technology to empower outcomes pay for proper outcomes, focus on prevention and primary care, give everybody a bare minimum level of coverage with access to primary care, catastrophic wraparound at the minimum. People can purchase higher plans if they want to. If employers wanna give uh, sweeter benefits, they can do that. This is freaking America. We can actually pull it off. We can have social justice because people will be covered. We won't destroy our economy. Our actual healthcare expenditures will go down. We'll have better outcomes. And we can tell the rest of the world to freaking suck it because we're America. We can actually do it. So this argument where it's like conservatives versus Democrats versus everybody, this is the wrong argument. Is healthcare a right? Is healthcare a privilege? It's the wrong argument. Get the care model right. Get frontline healthcare providers. And, and doctors and nurses and pharmacists and everybody to have a voice in this, to stand up and say, we're gonna build 3.0, we're gonna fund it this way, and the government can have this role, industry can have this role, pharma can have this role, insurance companies can have this role, and we can do it uniquely in the US in a way no one else has done it. Are we hearing this conversation? No, we're hearing dipshits in the Senate arguing with each other over stupid stuff. The liberals are like, it's not just, and the conservatives are right, take it all away and let the poor people die. That's what everybody <laughs> hears.
right? But that's not what, that's not the argument. I don't know. Should we read some comments? I got a meme for you, Z. You got a meme for me? <laughs> <laughs> you are such a bad man, Logan Stewart. It was Suck a, it, France. Suck for the, it. Suck it. For the podcast people, it was a French flag, and it said the French flag, and it was just a white surrender flag. That's just mean. Have you been to France? No. Neither have I. I want to go, though. <laughs> Please invite me to France. Um, some comments? Let's see. Um, Laura, let's see here. There's been pressure to cheapen healthcare, says Deb Higgins, by supplying cheaper, less well-trained personnel. Why is it a good idea to degrade the quality of personnel giving healthcare? Deb Higgins. Well, Deb, we should never degrade quality by allowing poor training. And this came up the other day when we were talking about nurse practitioners training and all that. We need the best trained workforce and all, everybody has a place on the team, but you need a lot of clinical hours, right? And you actually need collaboration with the rest of the team. And we can do that without cheapening the workforce. There's no need to do that. We can take care of everybody. Right now, we're seeing a ton of people. They come to the ER. You can't be necessarily turned away. Well, why don't we make it so that actually that's economically viable? There's always going to be rationing, meaning you don't do stupid stuff that doesn't make sense. So much of what we do in healthcare is a waste of money, guys. It's just a waste. Speaking of that, Z, Andrew had a good point here. He says, aren't people who abuse the healthcare system the same people neglected by social services? And this goes to a bigger point of how can you fix healthcare without fixing literally everything? Mm -hmm. mm. So people are like, Norway, bro. Denmark, look, you know, socialized medicine works and we could do it this way and the U.S. is the same thing. It's not the same thing because in Norway and Denmark they have social uh, networks that aren't healthcare that, that, that cover people for this stuff. In the U.S. we can't and won't seem to do that and whatever your ideology is, we should do that, we shouldn't do that. The fact is we don't. So that means the, the healthcare system has to take this stuff on. Now here's a question, Tom. If I say, Tom, you now have Medicaid and you can go to the ER for whatever you want and this and this and this, are you um, gonna do that? If the lines are long, I'm not going to. Right. So if there's a disincentive for me to waste my time, sure, but if I'm, you know, random Joe from the street and it's free and I'm just like, hey, yeah, my toe hurts. Maybe they'll give me some of that Delala I heard so much about. So in other words, what I'm hearing is you would be an idiot not mm. to abuse something that's been handed to you. Yeah, Pretty straight much. up. Yeah. I mean, I agree with that. So you have to create structures that, first of all, education is a piece of it. Socioeconomic stuff is a huge piece of it because the guy who, okay, look, Tom, look, I'm going to tell a little story. When I was broke, which means pretty much most of my college and medical school era. I had to work, I teach like MCAT to pay. That's why I had very small loans because I paid them off as I went because I worked all through medical school and through part of college. And Z Dad and Z Mom, they are, they're Indians, which I'm gonna tell you means one thing, cheap AF. <laughs> which means they said, get some loans, get some loans. But you know what? I'm Indian too, which means cheap AF. And so what I did was I decided, okay, I'm gonna work, work, work. Now, when I was that broke, dude, any way I could cheat to get something, if I would show up to a, to a hotel room for something, I would steal all the toilet paper, oh, I would steal yeah. all the uh, accoutrements, because I'm like, it's free. That, that is normal human. Why are we telling people they're bad people for doing what they're incentivized to do? What we have to do is change the incentives. That doesn't mean yanking away coverage. It means changing the structure of the coverage so that accountability and some degree. Now remember, there are people who have no control over what's going on. A child with asthma whose mom is a single mom who's working doesn't have control over the fact that the kid has asthma. So we have to also think about what's the right thing in an in a affluent modern society to take care of people. Where, by the way, this idea of healthcare as a right is crazy talk. I'm gonna go on record with this. Okay, it's not your right to take a service from someone else. That's the misuse of the word right. But regardless of whether healthcare is a right, here's the a, here's a thing at you. What is the right thing to do for people? And I would say, a minimum level of coverage for everyone is the right thing to do. So that's where I stand. Z, I found a picture of you from college. I'm gonna throw it up right now. This is offensive. <laughs> <laughs> I like the gold. That's the most offensive thing I've ever seen, <laughs> and uh, and I love it. It was Tom's idea. Hey, hey, and I got more discounts. <laughs> I want more discounts. No, my dad taught me everything I need to know about being cheap. Uh, he's amazing. Amazing. So, so Z, basically, if I can distill what you said. 
you admire the people that use the ambulance as a taxi? <laughs> I admire the fact that they're behaving according to what they're incentives gone. they've been given. Why wouldn't you? Medicaid, Uber. You can call 911 and it's get from It's kind of smart the way they've figured out how to work the system. I it mean, is. And I personally know people that do that. So. Well, right. Now, why can't we harness that intelligence, that collective intelligence, to actually do some good in the world? And, and that's a thing. I understand the conservative viewpoint on the abuse of uh, accountability. But I also understand the progressive viewpoint, and I refuse to use the word liberal because you people have poisoned it. The <laughs> progressive viewpoint, which is that, that there is a certain level of, of, um, of, of, of stuff we can do for people to give them the best chance in a meritocracy to succeed without taking advantage of the system. Now, there's always going to be some abuse of any system because people are smart and they'll figure out how to abuse it, right? Remember the whole welfare queen thing in the 80s that Reagan would talk about? That still goes on. Th did that well, go away? <laughs> well, but the thing is, apparently there was no such thing. Like, they were talking about it. It was just kind of a made-up thing. But the idea does seem feasible, that you could, you could be, you know, somehow harnessing welfare while not working, while making a lot of money on the side and X, Y, and Z. Wait, who said that went away? Because that happens. It just no. doesn't happen uh, as much as people were saying it I does. forget the article. I'll have to dig it up. It turns out that was... The actual case that he that Reagan used was not a real thing. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, either way, either way, I'm not messing with the Gipper. Well, right? for instance, here's one: the food stamp program in America was at a certain level. I think it was like 23 million or something like that, mm. and it went up to 40 during the 08 economic recession, which you would expect during a recession, right? It's still at 40 today. You get, de you get a debit card now. So it's still double what it was before 08. Now that we've and we've had a you know six year bull market and everything has returned to normal, right? Well, again, I mean, it gets to the question. I, I'm not going to get into whether that's true or not. I think it's a question of you got to structure incentives that actually allow people to maximize their ability to succeed in a meritocracy, and that does. But see, it's impossible to succeed in a meritocracy if you go medically bankrupt, which is stupid as hell. Like we should not allow that to happen. It, this is a what kind of culture is it that we allow this to happen? It's crazy to me, all right? Medically bankrupt is crazy. And the idea that, like, you know, a child wouldn't be covered if they have asthma, uh, to be able to have some minimal level of care to keep them alive, we just really have to ask ourselves, what kind of society do we want to have? Do we want a society with the proverbial welfare queens and people abusing the system? No. So we have to design it in a way. And I'm a believer in external design influencing human behavior, right? I'm an adherent to the elephant and the writer theory that we always talk about. And the path that they walk on matters. It affects behavior. Why don't we engineer that path in the best possible way? I just want to drag you down into partisan muck for oh, another God. moment. Oh, so, God. We always talk about having compassion for the underserved in, our, in America, but what about the compassion for the people that are paying for everything? The people that work hard, pay their taxes, and are literally floating everybody else. Where's the compassion for them? To see that their money is used efficiently and effectively. Or kept. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's a huge point, because look at, with the Affordable Care Act, a lot of people who are in the gray area, above 400% of, of poverty, who now have to get insurance, or they get a fine, now they have to pay higher, potentially higher premiums than before because of the nature of how plans, individual plans, the individual market changed under Affordable Care Act. So penalizing people who really do work hard, but now you have to understand, Tom, there are some people, they, they, you know, even the people who work hard have had some degree of societal um, advantage, whether their parents help them go through college or they struggled and worked really hard or it's just luck so there's some degree of that but the thing is if we allow everybody to at least have the opportunity to succeed then you can hold people accountable so i think it's important that's why i sit right in the center i see both sides of this and i don't think there's a magic answer but the big answer is let it be caregiver driven i think catastrophic insurance with some government help with a primary care engine in a 3.0 model that's focused on outcomes. That's how you fix healthcare. And that means the poor don't, you don't leave them on the street to die. You take care of them in the most cost effective way while in incorporating measures for accountability. And that we have to brainstorm and think about. What are those look like, right? So that you don't have abuse. It's always going to be a tough thing to do. But, and the problem with the US is there's entrenched interests on all sides that are going to push back against no matter, no matter what you try to do. You almost want to wipe it flat and start fresh using actual logic, but that's hard. That would be, that would be great. That would make too much I'm sense. I'm okay with everything that you've said. I just want it to actually 
happen. I want the money to go where it's supposed to go, and I know that it won't because it never does. <laughs> now that kind of cynicism, Tom Heineber, I think is what's poisoning society. Uh, it's also true, but <laughs> guess what, guys? We have 600,000 almost people in the z -Pack. Most of you guys are healthcare people or activist patients, people who care about this stuff. Why can't we have a voice? We have a voice here. Why can't we have a voice on, Ca on Capitol Hill? Why can't we have a voice in town hall meetings? Why can't we go overrun the whole thing? If we grow to a million, two million, five million, there's no reason that we can't. And listen, we don't even have to all agree. All healthcare is local, but we can agree that there's certain minimal levels that we want to reach. We want to have caregivers also supported without burnout, taking care of each other. We don't want workplace violence. We don't want to be in danger in the emergency department. We want accountability, not just for our patients, but also for ourselves to do the right thing for patients. And if we can do that, we can have a voice. We're pretty smart people, guys. They'd be afraid of us if we ganged up together. It's never happened in history. So stay tuned. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not cynical, Tom. I think it can happen. I think we basically just fixed healthcare? Woo. Mess around and fix healthcare, son. We're like Rich Chigga, man. <laughs> People are gonna be looking at us like, oh, that kid. Hot. Oh God, let's not do another. No, please no. Rich Chigga. Please no. no. Anyways, guys, I'm gonna look through your comments later. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, hit share. Hit like. Be a part of the movement. Have your voice heard. Tell us what your ideas are. And let's be civil to each other because this is a charged issue. There's a lot of partisan thinking, but look, Tom's kind of a moderate anarchist. Crypto anarchist. I'm kind of a progressive moderate. Logan's a crypto psycho fascist. <laughs> uh, actually, Logan's a more classical libertarian conservative. And we all get along and we all exchange ideas and we do it civilly. And I think what precipitates out from our discourse is actually some actionable-ish. Hey Z, summarize using your Indian voice over this meme. Okay, everybody, I'm telling you. Right now, <laughs> right now only, everybody Okay, the poor people, they are taking advantage. They are taking advantage of the system and we are going broke. And the rich people are spending too much money. Too much money on medicine that doesn't work. So we need right care, not left care, not middle care. We need right care, meaning correct. The care, the care needs to be correct. When you fix the care, when you take care of the caregivers, then you hold the patient accountable, but you also hold the caregiver accountable. When you do those things, that is when we will fix the system, fata fat, everybody will be okay, and then it will be time for the monsoon wedding only. <laughs> monsoon wedding! <laughs> okay, too much, that's racist, that's racist. Cut the feed, cut the feed. One, two, three. Just give me that.